Welcome to the John Hewitt birthday reading with Kate. <laughs> nice. Uh, and thank you for tuning in wherever you are in the world. Um, John Hewitt was a noted Northern Irish poet, curator, and political activist who died just over 30 years ago now. Uh, and every year, the Hewitt Society celebrates his birthday with their poetry reading. Usually, we're holed up in the John Hewitt Bar in the center of Belfast with beers and conversation flowing, interrupted by some poets reading their work. But of course, everything is different this year. And on behalf of the committee of the John Hewitt Society, I'd like to thank all of those who are working flat out to protect us and who are trying to bring this pandemic under control. Poetry seems to have gained a new traction during this time. And certainly John Hewitt believed in the transformative power of the arts to voice the concerns of its people and to shape a better society. Hewitt's work lent itself to both the enjoyment of literature, as well as the examination and repair of Ireland's divided society. Following on from what he started, the John Hewitt Society's primary aim is to promote cross-community and cross-border links. And we hope that we play a role in providing safe spaces for the art and political debate to flourish, encouraging understanding, tolerance, and acceptance of cultural diversity. To help us celebrate and further these aims, we're so delighted to bring to you two poets who are absolutely central to the literary landscapes of Ireland and England, and much further afield too, Sinead Morrissey and Roger Robinson. Sinead will read first, followed by Roger, and I'll introduce them separately. And then we might have a question and answer period afterwards. So Sinead first. Sinead was born in Northern Ireland and attended Trinity College Dublin, where she received a degree in German before gaining her PhD in English. After teaching in Japan, she returned to Ireland and was an integral part of the Seamus Heaney Centre at Queen's University, nurturing and encouraging poets such as Miriam Gamble, Stephen Sexton, Emma Must, Padraig Reagan, and many, many others. Sinead arrived at the Heaney Centre as a promising talent having already won an Eric Gregory Award and the Patrick Kavanagh Award. And her first two collections with Carcanet, There Was Fire in Vancouver and Between Here and There, suggested a major voice was in the process of blossoming. That early potential was certainly fulfilled. And with four subsequent collections and two selecteds, Sinead is now one of the most decorated and respected poets of her generation, both inside and outside of Ireland winning, and here we go, the UK National Poetry Competition, the Michael Hartnett Prize, the Forward Prize, the T.S. Eliot Prize, the Irish Times Poetry Now Award twice, the E.M. Forster Award, a Lannan Foundation Fellowship, a Leverhulme Research Fellowship, and most recently, the 2020 European Poet of Freedom Award. She is also a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature and is currently director of Newcastle University's Center for Literary Arts. Why so much glory? Well, that's a complex question, which can't really be addressed here. But Ireland is fortunate to have an incredible generational lineage of writers who come along and change the poetic landscape. Yeats and Kavanagh, Heaney, Mahon and Longley, Carson, Boland, Magookian and Muldoon, and now Sinead Morrissey, who would be at the very forefront of her generation of poets. When, as a writer, you add to this rich tapestry by changing the landscape yet again, you get noticed. Perhaps Sinead's great contribution is that she's the first major Irish poet for whom Ireland itself is not the dominant subject of her work. There are of course poems set in Ireland and there are intensely beautiful poems about her family, but she has taken us to Japan, New Zealand, Greece, Russia, China, Arizona, to the mines in Yorkshire, playhouses that hosted the Beatles, pre-World War I factory laborers, 18th century English prisons, and so on. On one level, her oeuvre is a joyride, and we can never second guess where she might be heading, just as we can never second guess 
where an individual poem might take us, weaving as they do so many seemingly disparate elements that ultimately combine to make something utterly fresh and formally dazzling. With the increased globalization of Irish culture and fundamental shifts in its internal power structures, Sinead provides an Irish poetics Thank you so for the much, 21st Paul. Century. Thank you for that. Amazing great pleasure to welcome. Um, I would so love to be in the John Hewitt bar uh, with a Guinness. Thank you. And uh, I'm, I'm very sorry that that's not possible. Um, but it's a great delight to be reading for the John Hewitt birthday uh, celebration this year. And it's a particular delight to be reading with Roger. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled that this is happening uh, and I've been looking forward to it for weeks and I can't wait to hear um, Roger's reading after mine. So um, I'm going to read four poems um, and um, they're all new. So they're, they're all from a new book in progress. And the first one is a lockdown poem, really. It's come out of the experience of being shut into our houses with our families um, and, uh, and that kind of sense of isolation. Um, and my son told me during lockdown that the world's smallest country is actually a semi-derelict naval fort in the sea between England and France called Sealand, um, which um, a man claimed in the 1960s as his own um, Republic. You can go online and you can buy flags and coinage of Sealand. Um, and, uh, and so <laughs> while I was in lockdown and, and locked in and thinking about being isolated, I was thinking about Sealand and I was also thinking about the absolute dead end isolationism of Brexit. And so uh, this poem is kind of a protest against that. Sealand. I know all the colours of the sea, dirt green, mud, tar, incarnadine. It laps at the pillars with its million lips, yet eats so slowly, I'll be long since dishevelled by sharks, by Osadax bone worms, eyeless burrowing by the time this kingdom topples. Fort of my heart, fort of my steel persistence, where there is only each instant, ringed and given and lit and without alternative. Carry me onto judgment. The washerwoman sea hangs out its mists like laundry. Dolphins, distant shipping. I made my wife a princess, but she rarely visits. She has flashy, miraculous teeth and loves to be photographed. Clouds, contrails, stars. A mare, libertas. I fret over inheritance like Henry. Even the gun deck reeks of freedom. Not a sliver in land, not a sliver of land in sight from the rust-eaten lookout. Sunrise, sunset. Sunrise, sunset. The days contain their replicas, which they kindly unfurl. Meals out of mess tins, admin, Horizon scanning, sleep so deep and faceless, I've reverted to factory settings by morning. The flag of the world's smallest country snaps in the wind, and I dream of a football team. As I jog the lovely contours of the bullseye helipad in the ever decreasing circles, Happiness happens. And um, in this next poem, I was thinking about the rapture 
uh, you know, this extreme Calvinist belief that claims that the saved will be ascended bodily into heaven and uh, leave the rest of us behind on earth um, to deal with um, the mess we've gotten ourselves into. So um, I kind of think of the rapture as a, as a failure to confront our consequences. Um, and I was also thinking of The Wizard of Oz uh, and how the beginning of the film set in the tornado in Kansas in black and white is um, is really a dust bowl context, you know, for that incredible flight of fancy into color that happens afterwards. And, um, and I kind of put those two things together and uh, turned The Wizard of Oz into a rapture narrative. Um, so this is Inside the Wizard. Because it was. Hunger abroad, jabbing its smoke funnel thumbs down precisely on neighboring farms. The exfoliated disc of the land disarmed. So flat to the horizon in every direction, it makes a circle wherever you stand. Dust onto dust. The grass destroyed, the cattle desiccated, the grace and napkin clamor of breakfast devoured by the wind. The government called it tornado belt weather, but we knew better. For our house to be lifted whole, for our roof to be lifted whole, and every other building smashed to kindling. For every word you have for what this meant, we have a better word. While Toto barked and ran from window to window, the thin pigs stranded below stared up at the vanishing architrave of all they knew, and we stared down as from a dirigible at the split earth's gritty distress, its rabid unanchoring. He will burn up the chaff in unquenchable fire. And how like us they were, the saints, in their burnished plaits and socks, standing in shining rows. If you've seen their faces once, as we have, you become unfrightenable. The colours of heaven were what we carried back, so bright and adamantine in our daily work, we kept them as a talisman or spell, like wishing trees or movies, only real. And I'm going to tell you a story now, um, and it's a story which is set in a new age community or commune um, with various community members, um, including a young boy called Rohan, who's about six or seven, and a community leader who I imagine to be in his late 30s or early 40s. And uh, this story is told in his voice and from his perspective. Um, but it's what happens in, in this community during um, a summer solstice festival. So this New Age community have, I imagine, um, various sort of semi-druidic festivals throughout the year where people from outside can come and participate in the activities. And um, on this particular summer solstice festival, um, a teenage girl turns up and, uh, and this is what happens. Solstice. This girl turns up one bright June evening with a rucksack. What's wrong with your teeth? asks Rohan. Braces. Show me. So she hooks out the whole contraption, 
holds it up to him on her palm. Ungainly, in between, a molting bird. She stands in the kitchen in her socks and blushes. Over supper, we talk about goats. Finbar says holding the male kid underwater and still it, until it stopped kicking was the hardest thing he's ever had to do. I watch her watching him as she eats. She's ravenous. Evening meditation. I offer her the angel cards spread out face down on a little silver platter. Pick one, I say. So she picks one and slowly turns it over. Now I tell the group, I say, not which one you chose, which one chose you. I laugh. Light, she says. It says light. Summer solstice festival, and she picks light. Rohan wants attention. You don't have to read to him if you don't want to. I say, no one else reads to him, but she's a soft touch, reads to him anyway. At dawn, during the fire ceremony, she gets dizzy standing on the edge of the stone circle and disappears into the trees. Back at the house, she falls asleep and doesn't wake for hours, the day already half gone, like a hole through a Chinese coin. Hello again. I say, hello, Rip. Megalithic energies can affect people like that. On Sunday, it rains. My wife stays inside with her pilgrimage friend from Australia. The girl and I go for a walk. I hold up my big umbrella over both of us, bringing her close. Sex grief. For men is a thing, I say, a real thing. We need help with our sex grief. There's no shame in it. Straining at the end of his rope, the billy goat glares at us with letterbox pupils. The wind is soft and textured along the shoreline like carded wool. Rohan is nowhere to be seen. Maybe you're a rainbow child, a rainbow child, a special being or incarnation born in the awakening to help. How would I tell? You can't tell. Other people can tell, but you can't tell. Why not? Because if you could tell, you wouldn't be a rainbow child. I know she knows what she's doing, chatting with Gypsy, chopping carrots, washing up. She pulses at the edge of my vision. Even when I am not with her, I am with her. It's been so quick, like wine through water or radio, or like the dead when you least expect them, raising their sorry arms. She's the only guest in the female dorm. I go in to wake her for morning meditation and she sits up, trust, holding the blanket to her chest. What did you dream? I ask. Canada, she says. Canada and injury. Someone who couldn't walk. Her face hasn't settled yet into its grown-up shape, but you can see it there underneath her inching bones ghosted. She hardly ever looks at me back. Getting to the future will be terrible. She ponders the creamy pebbles on the beach, her bobbed ends smacking at her mouth. Most people won't make it. Foam, gulls, bladder wreck. That's why we're doing this work here, now, breaking up boundaries, property, the self. All of it, wind, clouds, sky. My words like old cracked leaves spiraling endlessly.
On the girl's last day, Rohan's mother shows up. She's had her hair cropped short. Her eyes are black in her head and she's talking too fast. We should build a new annex, charge more for the guest house, repurpose the physic garden. Thingar protests. At lunch, Rohan doesn't want to sit next to her. He sits with the girl instead, recites the thanking prayer, O oh deity, O oh godhead, O oh fountain, in a too loud voice. Let's climb the mountain before you leave, I say. Just us. On the track up, she crushes grass heads between her fingertips as she walks. On the way down, the hills across the lock step close. Suddenly in focus, the mist blown off. And stare at us like sheep. And finally, um, I would like to read a poem in homage, um, in ecstatic homage, really, to the suffragette Emily Davison. Um, uh, when I moved to Morpeth three and a half years ago, I moved to a small town in Northumberland called Morpeth. And there's nothing really um, famous about Morpeth, except it happens to be where Emily Davison is buried. Um, and her grave is so beautifully attended um, children have written letters of thanks and it's bedecked with violet ribbons and it has deeds not words written as, as a big part of, of the kind of monumental structure that's part of her group. Um, and so um, I knew I, I had to write an Emily Davison poem and I finally did so last summer. So uh, this is for her. She is the suffragette who threw herself in front of the King's horse. Um, and this is captured on film, actually. I think she may be the first person who dies on camera. Um, and uh, and so um, I, I had a sense researching her, her life of someone who whose life was going very fast in and of itself. Uh, it was it was full of adventure and event. And um, latest kind of theories about her stepping out in front of the king's horse are that she wasn't, it wasn't a suicidal act at all. And that what she was trying to do was pin a suffragette scarf onto the king's horse as, as it passed by. Um, and, and I thought um, someone who does that or who believes even for a second that they could do that and that that would be okay. They must think that they in some ways are going as fast um, as, as a horse. So um, speed was a big thing in how I was thinking about Emily Davison. Um, and I, I think you could say that I've written this poem in horse, uh, in, the, in the kind of the, the meter of a horse, um, which speeds up towards the end. So this is um, a tourniquet for Emily Davison. A Haridin Houdini cages and not just the ribcage of that final horse you hailed like a tram on Tattenham Corner, they the reins of his bridle henting, but corsets, railings, handcuffs, cubbyholes, heat shafts inside the Houses of Parliament taunted you all your life, fair Emily, like the keep out signs on the King's estate or the clang of your yellowing cell in strange ways each time they frog marched you back. What manner of woman were you? Appalled editorials, harumph in a fog of pipe fumes, a child on a poster in a nacreous cardigan wet, stunted tears of neglect. Mummies, a suffragette outside Marlebone Station. At first, the slippery trick of fasting set you free by which the bones assert their own supremacy. Your sentences axed repeatedly just by turning the face of Kafka's hunger artist or a starveling Christ before Pentecost towards your captors. Queasiness in Whitehall, a burn like caustic soda through the notion of gentlemen. But it didn't take long for the state to stiffen its spine, roll up its sleeves, and conjure a bag of tricks of its own. A tube 
a buckle, a funnel, a gag, your own body breathing on its slab, forced to outfox you. You staggered from each feeding session, dishevelled and drenched, a veteran of rough seas and shipwrecks. It must have been dizzying, the tableau vivant of each arrest so grimly asymmetrical. Whatever cry for justice launched towards man and heaven, whatever momentary public flurry, exploding glass, fire in a pillar box, collapsed suddenly to a woman with her hair undone, pale as a peony pinned between policemen. Horses, compacted torsos and high-stepping hooves flanked you here also, their sinews the sinews of the immutable world, viciously reasserted. As rain continued to fall on the reasonable cobblestones, you were escorted away from the theatre of the street like an apostate, over and over again, in violet weathers. Boyd, maverick, hooked, through my humble work, already by 1909, you could never be bound by the epithets found on most women's headstones. From letters to newspapers, to stones, to horsewhips, to dropping yourself from a balcony, if Calvary haunted you, it was Calvary garlanded with deeds, not words, white dresses fluttering from its crosses. But the century, as well as your life, was speeding up, portraits of nothing and very like, tinted steam, cast back at its witnesses as jittery footage. So as the 815 from Victoria bore south through the shuttered villages and children stood to watch it pass as always and a slack mist lay on the fields and London was emptied of bookies and flower sellers and motor cars stalled at the gates and women in hats like avalanches chatted and laughed. Little heart flowers, little emptiness as bubbles in the blood cascading upwards. You fingered the stub in your pocket, the scarf at your throat, and the train dispatched its smoke, and the crowd surged high as a wave and set you down on time, and the guard rail snickered. Then your ashen flash and fall so fast, the newsreel almost missed it, the dynamite of tenth of a second. Then nothing. Oh, well, thank you very much, Sinead, for that. Um, you're very generous in your readings and very and very often read new work for us. And it's always a thrill. And that last poem in particular reminded me of hearing Vanity Fair and Electric Edwardians for the first time and the hairs on the back of my head standing up or whatever. Um, it was a wonderful experience. Um, and thank you so much. And you, you've sort of given us a a little snapshot of what I was sort of suggesting there at the beginning in the introduction. Um, but we'll get into that perhaps more in the Q&A, but the, the sort of feminist perspective, the wide range of subject matter, uh, the intertwining of all of the disparate elements that all come together in a sort of glorious climax at the end. Um, as always, an amazing reading and, and thank you so much, really terrific. And now we're moving on to Roger Robinson. Um, um, let's see, let me pull this up if I can. Yes. Roger is a writer, musician, activist, and educator. He was born in London to Trinidadian parents, and after a childhood spent in Trinidad, he returned to the UK when he was 19, living in Brixton before he moved to Northampton. Often branded a dub poet, that genre's concerns with working class lives and protest remains a strong thread throughout his work. He published two pamphlets with Flip Die, Suitcase, and Suckle, before being taken up by People Tree Press. And his debut, The Butterfly Hotel, was shortlisted for the Caribbean's Premier Poetry Award, the OCM Bocas Prize. He has also been shortlisted for the Oxford Brooks Poetry Prize and highly commended by the Forward Poetry Prize. He was chosen by Decibel as one of 50 writers who have influenced the Black British writing canon and in 2020, he won the T.S. Eliot Award with his collection A Portable Paradise. An important mentor and educationalist, Roger founded Spoke Lab, 
a collaborative venture with Theatre Royal Stratford East when he was associate artist there. And he is also co-founder along with the amazing Malika Booker of Malika's Kitchen, a writing collective based in London. He has received commissions from amongst others, the National Trust, London Opera House, the BBC, National Portrait Gallery, Gallery and the VNA. He is also lead vocalist and lyricist for King Midas Sound, whose acclaimed debut album, Waiting for You, is with Hyperdub Records. And he has also released solo albums with Chitari Records. Roger says of A Portable Paradise that it aims to fully render the lives of people of color and that it came together very quickly. If it responds to our immediate times, it is also a collection that makes universal the causes and injustices of foregrounds, as well as the humanity that binds us or should bind us. It is a raw but skillfully crafted response to a variety of public and personal tragedies and trials, including the Grenfell Tower fire, the Windrush scandal, the legacy of slavery, migration, the premature birth of his son, and perhaps, perhaps arching over all of this, the quest for the portability of paradise, be it in the sublime transfiguration or rapture of Grenfell's victims, a Mark Rothko painting, acts of intimacy and kindness, the devotion of a maternity nurse, the body of his living son, or the legacy of his grandfather and the cyclical nature of the struggle towards something better. As his fellow Trinidadian Janine Mendes Franco writes, Robinson's words are a balm to the bitterness of life. A portable paradise compassionately recognizes the humanity within us all bound together by an almost reverent tone of dignity, even in powerlessness. It is with very great pleasure that the Hewitt Society welcomes Roger Robinson. Thank you so much for that introduction. Wow, it's really nice. And thank you so much, Sinead. Like, uh, I have not seen you read actually before and you're an amazing reader of your book. I read your poems, but I've never seen you read them before. And boy, they come to life amazingly. Thank you so much. Um, super happy to be down to hear with John Hewitt Society on John Hewitt's birthday. I'm just gonna read a, a couple of poems. The first poem, I'm gonna read from this book, A Portable Paradise. And A Portable Paradise came, you know, at, at a certain point I've been living in England more than I've been living in Trinidad. And I was, uh, you know, we were trying to have a baby. And I realized that I really had to turn my eye towards England and really survey it for my son. What was the world he was coming into? Um, and so that was the basis of it. But because I've grown in Trinidad, I thought that I wanted to kind of bring the paradise that I had from Trinidad here and make that paradise portable. But so, so what happened is like I started to... Uh, really have a kind of philosophical excavation of what what paradise is and i'll read a few poems like that but then you know uh, politics starts to migrate into the book a lot of things happen that affected um black people um and they're all in a way linked to paradise like the grenfell tower fire disaster there were a lot of immigrant communities who lived there who came to england looking for paradise and literally got a burning inferno of hell and then you know the wind rush you know uh elder west indians being taken from here in the dead of night without any proper due course and being taken back to a land where they were from. But where was their paradise now? Was going back there, their paradise? So paradise started to kind of warp and weft. And, um, and my son also had a very convoluted birth story. And so paradise began to stand for hope for me too. So paradise began to morph into different things in the book. So I'm going to read a few things from different sections. Also, there's some ekphrastic poems that I wrote you know, thinking about paradise, but also trying to get out of my own head as I use, you know, painting poems, ekphrastic poems to do to kind of, you know, take me out of myself a little bit. Um, picking up on what your name was reading about the rapture, this first poem is called The Missing, and it's, called, it's for the victims of the Grenfell Tower fire disaster. As if their bodies became lighter. Ten of those seated in the front pews of the church began to float and then to lie as if on a bed, then pass down the aisle as if on a conveyor belt of pure air, slow as a funeral cortege 
past the congregants, some sinking to their knees in prayer. One woman, rocking back and forth, muttered, What about me, Lord? Why not me? The risen stream slowly, so slowly, out the gothic doors of the church, up to the sky, finches darting deftly between them. Ten streets away, a husband tries to hold on to the feet of his floating wife, and at times her force lifts him slightly off the ground, his grip slipping. He falls to his knees with just her high heeled shoes in his hands. He shields and squints his eyes as, he is, as she is backlit by the sun. A hundred people start floating from the window of a tower block. From far enough away, there could be black smoke from spreading flames, a father with his child on top of his shoulders, men in sand-colored galabeas, a woman with an Elvis quiff and vintage glasses, a deep indigo hijab flapping in the wind, an artist in a wax cloth head wrap, all airborne. Amongst the cirrus clouds, floating like hair, they begin to look like a separate city. Someone looking on can mistake them for new arrivals to earth. They are the city of the missing, and we now the city of the state. This is another poem dedicated to the victims of the Grenfell Tower fire disaster. It's called the Portrait Museum. The morning after, the streets filled with portraits of missing people. Brothers with bushy beards, olive skin, wrinkled face grandmothers, pigtail daughters with red ribbons smiling, stuck on tree trunks, walls, and fence boards, the neon red missing, floating above their heads. In a minute of pure clairvoyance, we understand that many of these pictures are the faces of the dead, some looking like they were saying goodbye at the picture shot at a family gathering. Without sleep, some struggle to keep their poster straight, stop the cellar tape from sticking to itself. These were the flimsy paper faces of hope for the living. Those not taped well are blown away on the breeze. Many with posters refused this first day of mourning. As these went on, the wind blew most of them away. It's called Ghosts, and this is another one in that series for the Grenfell Tower fire disaster. Ghosts. You feel it as soon as you settle into your new flat. Perhaps you are making rocket salad with lemon dressing. The smell of Elras Hanut and cumin will assail your nose, make you think for a minute. You turn on a light, and your hand will carry a faint scent of cocoa butter. You'll come home from the office, and a young woman in a rust-colored hijab, barefoot in mint pajamas, whom you've never met before, will agitatedly ask you the way out, but by the time you point, she'll have disappeared. Interrupting your evening's Netflix elections, you hear the feet of at least six small children tramping overhead. The copper taps in your refurbished room run smoke for a few seconds before flowing with water. Your weekend lover says he'd rather stay over at his place and gives you no reason. You'll find yourself making up reasons to stay late at the office or catch drinks with friends. At night, a roaring heat will break you into sweat. And no matter how you try, you can't wake up and you can't breathe. You'll hear a call to prayer mixed in with fellow Kuti's zombie and a five-year-old girl constantly screaming for help from the guttural part of her voice. And you'll sit in the darkness for a while, clasping your knees, looking out your extra large window at the view you've paid so dearly for. Um, so I'll read a couple of the Paradise poems. Um, these, these poems, they punctuate uh, like each, the end of each section of the book, of each uh, series, um, except for one. And uh, somebody asked me why. And I asked him, why do you think? And he says, blah, 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 blah. I said, yeah, that's exactly it. And that's what I'm sticking with. But I'll tell you what he said later. The job of paradise. It is the job of paradise to comfort those who've been left behind. 
to think that all those loved and lost would live on there like tiny gods. It is the job of mumble prayers to help you calm your hurts and fears. It is the job of the long black hearse to show we head to death from birth. It is the job of a clean, neat grave to remind us how to live our days. If only I could live my days till death suffice, I make earth feel like paradise. This is a, another paradise poem. Uh, it's, that, it's the last poem at the end of the book and the title poem called A Portable Paradise. And if I speak of paradise, then I'm speaking of my grandmother who told me to carry it always on my person, concealed, so no one else would know but me. That way they can't steal it, she'd say. And if life puts you under pressure, trace its ridges in your pocket, smell its piney scent on your handkerchief, hum its anthem under your breath. And if your stresses are sustained and daily, get yourself to an empty room, be it hotel, hostel, or hovel. Find a lamp and empty your paradise onto a desk, your white sands, green hills, and fresh fish. Shine the lamp on it like the fresh hope of morning and keep staring at it till you sleep. Uh, what shall I read now? Oh, I'll read this. Um, I had done some music, music, uh, like music and art poems. And this is a poem for John Coltrane. Uh, so I had heard from a fellow musician who's father was in the studio with John Coltrane. He said that um, John Coltrane, who was a famous saxophonist, did this album called Ascension in a planetarium. And he had, like, they lent him a planetarium and he looked through this massive telescope. And he had that and, like, a, just a table full of cocaine. And so he'd snort the cocaine and look at, the look at the stars and play them as if they were notes. And he did the entire album like that. And I was like, wow, whoa. I mean, where do you have to get to the point where it's just like a planetarium and a hill of cocaine? That's it. This is what we need. You know, so so this is a, a poem to him. I, I have to say that there are lots of John Coltrane poems in the world because he's a famous saxophonist and I hate every single one of them. But this is the best one of all. Ascension for John Coltrane. I heard that as you recorded Ascension, your table had a small white cocaine hill. Through a telescope's dark planetarium, you closed one eye and viewed the world so big, looking for some language of the heavens, snort, blow, snort, blow, um, where constellations inhaled by night sky, blowing through rhythms to blue notes, a meditation, stars blinking, tiny gods of light, the world is so vast, but music is bigger, so this is freedom, so this is your life, there is no you, just spiraling sounds, pulsing like quasars, light shooting up, 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 a celestial shoot, to be a god, sound is to be moving, the universe is circular breathing, Coltrane, Coltrane, look, your nose is bleeding. Um, I'll just read a couple more. This is another art one. This is from um, this. I was asked by the National Portrait Gallery to uh, write a poem for Stubbs' whistle jacket, which is a horse that I had previously picked up in a bar on a card and had it at the side of my coffee table. And, um, and then I, I found out about the horse and realized it was Stubbs Whistle Jacket. And then they asked me, like, literally a week or two later to write a poem about Stubbs Whistle Jacket. So I thought, man, this is too much serendipity, you know. So I wrote it. This is it. Stubbs, by the way, Stubbs was abs an absolute lunatic in, in to trying to make art. It's just like just going way beyond what was legal or what was moral. But um, people loved his um, horse portraits. But then he tried to stop making horse portraits. And people was like, we don't care about any of this. All we like is horse portraits from you. And uh, so I was like, wow, he got, he got trapped by his obsession. And I felt it was very much like poetry. <laughs> anyway, Stubbs whistle jacket. Looking at Stubbs' horse in the dark, it becomes clear 
he was no glamorizer of muscle, no fetishist of fur and skin. Convinced that the body was host to the horse's spirit, he began making martyrs of horses, subjecting them to jugular death, beads, beads of sweat rolling down their barrel torsos, their eyelashes fluttering with a flourish as he pumped them with warm tallow till their pulsing veins and arteries slowly came to a halt, suspending them in a standing or trotting pose by a series of hooks and tackles amid buckets of clotting blood first stripping off the skin. He worked his way through muscle by muscle, bone by bone, dissecting and defining limbs, turning the pages in this book of horse. So even in the dark of the museum, I can feel this horse breathing. Um, I'll just read one more poem. And this poem is, um, uh, part of the book is about um, the, the, the devaluation of black bodies and how it's easy when a black body is devalued to either kill them or abuse them. Um, and I originally was going to put this poem in the book because it was about my son and I've been moving away from the more autobiographical poems. But I thought because um, this woman who was a nurse, a Jamaican senior nurse that had valued my son's bodies, I, I, I thought it was good to put it in. Um, Grace. And I'll just end with this. Graced. That year, we danced to the green bleep sunscreens. My son had come early, just the one kilogram of him, all big head, bulging eyes, and blue veins. On the ward, I met Grace, a Jamaican senior nurse who sang pop songs on her shift like they were hymns. Your son feisty. He just pull off all the breathing mass them. People spoke of her in half tones down these carbolic halls. Even doctors gave way to her when it came to putting a line into my son's nylon thread of a vein. She'd warned junior doctors with trembling hands, may only letting you try twice. On her night shift, she pulls my son incub son's incubator into her room, no matter the tangled confusion of wires and machines. When the consultant told my wife and I on morning rounds that he's not sure my son will live, and if he lives, he might never leave the hospital, she pulled us quickly aside and said, him have no right to tell you that just raw so. Another consultant tells the nurses to stop feeding a baby who will soon die, and she commands her loyal nurses to feed him. Feed him. No baby must dead with a hungry belly. And she sit in the dark, rocking that well-fed baby, held to her bosom, slowly humming the melody of Happy by Pharrell. And I think if by some chance I am not here and my son's life should flicker, then Grace, she should be the one. Thank you. I just have to say that my son is completely fine. He does Taekwondo because I, I, I keep forgetting to say that after reading. So people are like, oh my God. <laughs> but, but he's very, very well. And thank you for having me. <laughs> Oops. Oh, I, I can't hear you. Are you. Right. Okay. I think yeah, I'm yeah, unmuted. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Roger, thank you so much for that meeting. You're I'm, welcome. I'm, you're welcome. I loved reading the collection, but of course, always, it's just wonderful to hear the poet actually speaking the right. poems in, in their own voice. And that last poem in particular, place, when I first read it, it just brought home the whole idea that so often lives generally can hinge on the actions of one person of course, and, yeah, yeah. and what they do or they don't do. Yeah. Um, and the, the power of that poem in particular struck me, as, as did the opening poem to the whole yeah, collection yeah, yeah. and the, the rapture that we hope and we wish for um right. for those for those victims it's just yeah, in, sure. incredibly moving and and thank you very much for for that oh man amazing you're very i'm so glad to be here and get through machine it is a particular pleasure yeah. for me too yeah and it was interesting um because you both there's a there well she made one because she was my phd supervisor and i wrote about the performance of poetry okay. so yeah. long-suffering Sinead for for four years or so all right um but there's an element of performance in in both of the way that you read yeah. your work um, and it, it really, I think, it lifts it off the page. Is it something that you consider consciously when you're giving a reading? Um, How you're reading it? I think my mom's a very good storyteller. 
So I think a lot of my mannerisms are just my mom's. But to be honest, I actually come from the performance poetry scene. Like I, it probably took some 20 something years ago, so people kind of forgot. But I used to be like with apples and snakes and stuff. So when I first came out with poetry, I was writing on the page, but I used to work very hard at performing it because there weren't much options for black writers. So it's like some 23, 24 years ago. And sometimes the poetry stages were the only places you can get the poems heard. Because, you know, a lot of the journals weren't publishing black poets. And, uh, and a lot of the book publishers, except for a few, weren't publishing black poets. So a performance was just a platform that we could go to. And, um, and because of that, I met a lot of other writers who were also using the platform, like Malika Booker, you know, um, and Jacob Samuel Rose. And we were all writers because we were really intensely interested in the page. But we were all like, listen, let's just get this out how we can. So it became a, a tactic, performing became a tactic. And I actually read less animatedly now. <laughs> <laughs> Which is quite interesting, you know. What I'm it's like it used to be like all gesture, all poses, all you know. But now I'm like, I'm like, it's just, it's just changed, you know. I, I, I don't want my personality to swallow. I want to bring something else besides the page, but I don't want my personality to swallow the perception of the poem, you know. So yeah. I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah my my first my first immersion into that, uh, I I taught at Leeds for three years, and although there's a big oral culture here in Ireland, uh, a yeah. long, proud tradition. It was the first time I'd been sort of immersed in a performance poetry kind of scene. Yeah, yeah. I heard people clicking away, and it's like, what, 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 what what's going on? What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> it's really, I loved it. It was great. Um, I, I, I loved my students and, these, and people like Malika and Khadija Ibrahim um, made it very special. Very but special. she made you read better than most performance poets, I see. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Seriously, like, seriously, I was like, whoa. I did not expect you to read like that. You know, you read better than most performance poems I see because it's. it's oh, that's it's a like, high compliment coming from you, Roger. For real. Um, I mean, I was transfixed, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, I work like you do, Roger. You know, I, I work, I think, for the page and yeah. I work a lot with form and, um, and it takes me ages and ages to get the poem kind of right. So I rewrite it and there's all that kind of text based labor but then maybe because I've spent so long with it I don't think a poem is finished until I know it by heart and I don't uh, really think it's an it's a live thing until you're reading it and people are listening to you like there's uh, something totally different about about the poem when it it does it lifts off the page and it becomes this kind of shared thing in the air between people uh, and and that's that's what I write to I think that all the page stuff, which I'm also obsessed with, is a means to getting to that end, you know, to that end of being like that amazing right. and, you know, sustained image in your opening poem about, about airiness, you know, it's, it's you want a poem to ultimately overcome the page and, and be an airborne, living, breathing uh, like that. event, yeah. you know. Mm. Paul Farley talked. Uh, Paul Farley mentored me for uh, on a, on a program for a while, and he talked about. I hope I'm not misquoting him. He talked about poetry and who's recognized, and the idea, or the idea of repeatability, if that's a word. You know how how easy it is to repeat a poem, and um, or uh, how easy it's to grab onto the central ideas of a poem and quote a line. That's how it shares in communities, not necessarily through books, but through the oral culture. That's how we remember, that's how we remember even page boards, you know? Yeah, yeah, but yeah. what I quite like about what you're saying is that the idea of you work it for the page and then you make an, a form from your lungs, you know, a form from your yeah. lungs. And then yeah. you, you put that out in the air and other people can take that in into their bodies. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah. Like from, uh, yeah, I don't know, I'm, uh, I'm rambling on. But um, no. I quite like how it trans transmits into something that somebody can take in. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Inspiration, you know, is about breathing in, isn't it? And yeah, yeah. 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 Cool. And performance might be about breathing out. Yeah. Awesome. Performance might be about breathing out and someone else breathing in. It's a yeah, kind of, yeah. It's a chain of transmission, isn't it? And yeah. I think I don't know the the poetic structures that we're all working with on the page are all basically structures which help us. Meet. Like Paul Farley was saying, they are mnemonic. You know, they help us remember. Um, it's all about it's all about portability, isn't it? And transmission, yeah. and 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 it being passed down like a kind of bequest to yeah. or passed across to other people. It's also bound up with the idea that it's a gift. 
and yeah. yeah. I quite I also quite like how you can't control the poem that enters into society. Like I've been really lucky that a portable paradise, its poem is just literally in every anthology, every poster, every way you call it. But it's a poem that I actually didn't remember writing. Like it wasn't a poem that struck me in particular. The Grenfell poem, when I wrote it, I was like, it wore me out, you know? The Grace poem nearly destroyed me. A lot of the Grenfell poems really destroyed me. So I often thought about poems being effective based on, my, on how it wore me out. Yeah, and then I realized that that has nothing to do with how people perceive. Yeah, yeah, perceive it's a a totally, poem. it can be a totally different thing. And like your Grace poem was our, I mean, that was our support the NHS poem in lockdown. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. yeah. The context yeah. just fed into, you know, the preciousness, not only of that encounter and what it meant, but the preciousness of what we've got in our NHS. Yes. And, you know, yes. yeah, yeah, it, yeah. it was, it was, yeah, it's amazingly. Yeah uh enlivened by that context and yeah, yeah, yeah. you know the fact that we were all on social media as well and on digital uh, in a way we we haven't been, so been yeah exactly. you know it just it went everywhere didn't it, it yeah 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 the anthem of lockdown was your yeah, one yeah, yeah. This one. yeah oh thank you i was i wasn't even thinking about it there was another one called on nurses that seemed to spread everywhere because the nurses were doing so much work mm. and um and you could you can't i i had no clue i'd probably written that at least two years before the book actually came out in 2019. So you can never tell what yeah. what is it, what time happens, and there's no predictability for it. I was talking to someone else the other day, and they were saying that, you know, whether you agree with the idea of the spiritual or not, that you, true practice and repeated practice and craft, you can tip into the idea of the spiritual by mistake. It's not something you can bring up on the nervous system, just I'm, like, I'm going to make a spiritual poem. It's something that comes with craft and practice, you know. Like that one that you did about the um, the suffragette. I'm like, whoa, what? You know what I'm saying? It's just like the way that you go at the rhythm you go at, it's like a lot of craft to make that work, you know? Because yeah, like, yeah. you know what I'm saying? And then it because of because of your strong, strong craft, then it becomes incredibly moving. You know what I'm saying? It's like whereas you could tell it to someone and it wouldn't have the same effect, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That took me. <laughs> Yeah. Oh my God, that poem nearly killed me. You know, yeah, 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 so yeah. hard. It was so so hard. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, it only works if it reads like like effortless, like in sure. like in breath or a gallop or a jewel. Yeah. That kind of it's it's a torrent of language that just ends as she ended so abruptly. Yes. And yeah, if you yeah, don't yeah. get that sense of kind of roll, it's not going to work. But it's so hard to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, you did it. You did it really well. You did it incredibly well. And it, and it was moving because of its craft. You know what I'm saying? It's like, because you told us what was going to happen. That wasn't particularly good. It's just like, yeah, she got trampled. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you told us what was going to happen. You told us, like, oh, was it, you know, you, you gave us, like, it could be a number of things that happened. Loads of people have, like, theory. But then you hear the poem, you're like, whoa. You know, it's like, hmm. Nate has a, quite a special ability to, <laughs> to be able to take the poem in directions that we don't really expect. Yeah, and for sure. That's, that's one, I think that will be another one of the ones that enters the Sinead Morrissey canon. Um, it related to that in a little, a little bit um, in terms of how the poem becomes perhaps more than a subject. There, Sinead will know there's a, a great uh, late critic called uh, Dennis O'Driscoll, who was a poet also. And he, he talks about poetry being an antidote to the journalistic present. He doesn't really mean by that that we shouldn't concern ourselves with the immediate present because I, we have to respond to that, I think. But I think what he's trying to get is that the, that the poem has to be something more than just the journalist present, mm. um, that it has to have a, a life beyond that immediate moment. Um, and is that something that would concern you, uh, Roger and Sinead, in terms of, well, of, of subject matter, if you if you pick something that is going to be a pandemic poem, or sure. um, is, do you do you think okay, well that I need to write about this, but there has to be another element to it that mm. that lifts it beyond the immediate. Mm. Cool, cool. You go ahead. Well, I think I think you just I don't know whether the thing we were talking about transmission, you know, and all those ideas about the poem becoming airborne, and maybe. The ground is the journalistic moment, you know, Grenfell Tower burning is the journalistic ground. And then the poem comes in and the poem, you know, transubstantiates that in a way. And it, trans it does that through this 
through this image, you know, and and it, it I, 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 I wouldn't be prescriptive at all about like you can't write about immediate things. I think we can, um, you know, it's uh, you can make lasting art out of that. It's how you do it, you know, it's how you do it. And often it's about actually changing the substance, you know, through through art and through the poem into into another kind of reality and that's what we carry away that's the portable bit that's what we carry away from that um so yeah i think also to tether it to our moment is also what often gives it meaning right it's like <laughs> you know we are all in lockdown and we are all in this particular weird moment you know and that is going to it's going to influence what we write and how we write. And yeah, I think it's it's very important not to cut ourselves off either, um, just as it's important to do something else with it. Yeah, I think, you know, it's like the, the present moment, to some extent, is just, it's just a moment. But what I'm aspiring to is some kind of human truth. And some kind of grace you know what i'm saying so i'm using the moment to get to the human truth and grace and it's less about the moment and more about the human truth and the grace and hopefully that translates but also too i've had some like really good examples like people like linton quasi johnson this in 70s early 80s talking about police uh, aggression towards black people but what's happened as time went on it kind of nearly got elevated into documentary yeah, but but another level, I want to have a better word that word spiritual, a spiritual documentary of a time. So it serves, it serves as a recording. And I've been to a few of his readings as I got to meet him. And I realized that how all generations connect to it. All generations connect to that moment that he had in the 70s and 80s. Um, because it's so well wrought, it's so full of craft, it's so moving. Uh, and I think you need those types of elements to it. I'm actually quite interesting, interested in poetry as a kind of new form of journalism. You know, something that's not just factual, something that's not just an anecdotal, but just some, some liminal space in between where poetry can report on things. And, and, I, and my new collection is all prose poems, but a lot of it's about this time, about, you know, like, but the, the, the things that led up, you know, there's been held down, but then it's also, you know the blm movement there's george floyd there's things happening in america there's things happening in england and reacting to that in a way that's even more like in a Tony morrison way it's nearly more magical realist surrealist prose poetry you know it's like so it's nearly like a dream you know like it's and and, and general format shows that well actually life is so incredibly crazy at the moment that only a prose poem will do to kind of fit how crazy it is you know and so yeah. the form is helping me kind of navigate how weird how weird it is in the sun. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a there's a wonderful podcast with yourself, uh, Roger and Johnny Pitts on the Guardian website, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, which I was okay. listening to a couple of days ago. Um, and I mean, there's so much in it that is you know, that is of great interest. Um, there's one thing that um, you say, I think, uh, quoting Johnny, uh, that Europe doesn't export its blackness to other countries, unlike say america yeah uh, and I, that struck me really forcibly because i hadn't actually really thought about that to be honest yeah, with you. And, yeah, yeah. Until, and that's, that's, that's john johnny taught me that i mean johnny's younger than me but you know he's, he's, he's amazing he's amazing dude <laughs> we, we're gonna do a book together me and him yeah he's yeah. phenomenal he is phenomenal um, man and, he, uh, and he's, he's theoretical man he's like a proper young theorist you know it's like yeah, he's uh, deeply deeply impressive yeah, and yeah it, no, it, it got me struck it got me thinking about the idea of exporting um, well, identity and culture. Here's, here's, a, here's a story. So my son, who's six and a half years old, I mean, we homeschool him now, but up to last year, he was going to school. He came back from Black History Month and he said, Dad, do you know about Rosa Parks? I was like, what? yeah, but what do you know about Rosa Parks? So he tells me, like, they tried to get her to sit down, you know, a real basic version of it. I say, yeah, but you know, she's American, right? He, he, he was like, yeah. I said, do you know anything? Did they teach you anything about Black history in England. They was like, no, we just did Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, Malcolm X, and they've been doing this for years. Yeah. It's like, like most black people I talk to, I say, name five people who fought for your freedom in England. 
and they haven't been educated about it. You know what I'm saying? And most people don't know. You know, I ask even people in my immediate family, I've asked the university lecturers, name me five people who fought for the freedom of black people in England. You know, and, and but England has a sense of trying to erase colonialism and, and imperialism and the general history of slavery. So they don't want to give you any context. What they want to give you is the whole idea of the glorious England. Yeah. And so that's why it's not taught anywhere. And that's not that's that's why you people don't know about black Britishism. And that's why it's not important. So there's a there's a contextual reason why black black culture is not important. And they have black culture, like we know here. You know, I mean I'm I'm ranting on, but yeah. No, no, no. So, and I mean Johnny goes on to talk about Belgium and France in, yes, in very sure. similar ways. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. And how we, we don't question just fundamental things that we accept every day, like Belgian yeah. chocolate. Yes. Um, and how that is colonial for sure. in its sure. origins and things. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it was a fascinating podcast, and I would re it's recommend hard, it's everyone. Hard to, it's hard to write about Black culture when for so many years you've been devaluing Black people. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And so if, you, if, if you're writing about the culture, then the devaluations are a lie. You know what I'm saying? Through history. Yeah. You know, so. it, it got um, me so thinking Trust too. me, see, similar <laughs> things happen in Ireland. <laughs> well, I was, I was just... Why did you say that? Because I was, I was thinking about this exportation of identity. And it seems to be the Irish are masters at exporting <laughs> their identity. Uh, yeah. You know, it's, uh, they, they've got a, a certain kind of identity. They sort of created an Irish identity, which they've exported to the world, if you like. You you know, think, um, you th I'm not Patrick's, sure about that. I'm not sure about that. St. Patrick's Day and, and things like that. It's, or maybe it's been manufactured. And, and, uh, I, think it's, the, it's, I think what's been export is, is the idea of Irishness. Yes, but the Irish exactly. people I meet, it doesn't equate. It doesn't. Yeah. It does not, you know, there's no equation. You know. Yeah, I, I think there's a danger of sometimes. I mean, I'm not becoming... Irish, so I have no position. No, to no, talk no. So no, so no, no, no. I, I don't want to overstep my bounds here. You know, so. Well, that's where I wanted to bring in Sinead, maybe, and this, and this yeah. idea that possibly sometimes what what's exported is a cliche, and that that cliche needs to be dismantled and examined more fully. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's really important that we don't eschew complexity. Um, and, uh, you know, um, I, I'm, I'm so kind of um, enraged by the whole Brexit thing. <laughs> and I think it's, it's a means of eschewing complexity. And it, it's a kind of, I feel, it, I feel it as a disenfranchisement of me and my identities, which I feel are so multiple. You know, like Northern Ireland confines the image of Ireland that's being exported all over the world. Northern Ireland... People, do, you know, I think, you know, people don't know what to do with the narrative of Northern Ireland or the fact that it's very complicated or they don't know what to do with it, certainly since the troubles have ended, which was ages ago now. And, you know, you've, you've got something which is rhythm and multiple and it's very hard to to export that because to export something, you have to simplify it. And um you know, I grew up in Northern Ireland. My mother's English, my father's Irish. You know, I always felt both. Um, but I always felt really European. I, you know, and just this idea that, you know, that is other and it's not part of me anymore is why? Who says? I didn't say so. And yet it's just being, it's being imposed. And I think it's, I think it, yeah, I think it's, it, it's, it's, it's a drive towards, simplicity that I think is deeply worrying. I was in Poland um, in August. I went in a little window to, to get this European Port of Freedom Award. And, you know, and it was extraordinary to be in Poland because Poland is in the middle of a fascist takeover by truth and justice. And, you know, a big drive of truth and justice is, is to, well, to other people. So, you know, the LGBTQ community are in real trouble now in Poland because of the the level of vindictive legislation against them and but you know to so other people and then you simplify your national narrative and you know the national narrative that law and justice propagate are white catholic um you know uh, heterosexual and if you don't fit into that then there's going to be problems and you know involved in that is a whole simplification of history a whole simplification of cultural memory you know they're going after museums and they're going after the ways in which the story of Poland is being told and it's deeply frightening so you know I would make a stick for complex identities and 
and a, and a more nuanced, complicated understanding of, of history and how history gets us to where we are. Um, yeah, so I, I'm really wary of, um, uh, you know, portable, you know, national identities or mythologies of people. It's so reductive and frightening. Well, I think that might be a, a terrific place to uh, say thank you. I mean, I, we were sort of trying to come in at about an hour, and that is about an hour. Um, and w combined with the amazing poetry and what we've just been talking about, I think that's plenty of food for thought. Um, so on behalf of the John Hill Society, I'm about to eat some birthday cake now. Um, I wish we could uh, have some. <laughs> you can have some virtual. I'll, I'll send a virtual slice to you. Um, thank you. So, uh, really, I mean, I, you know, I've been to a lot of readings and I've been involved in a lot of readings, but this will absolutely be up there. In terms of oh, the thank you. Such a pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Well it's just amazing. Thank you. It's been so, a real, real pleasure. So lovely. Yeah, thanks so much, Paul. And Stephen, I know you're there in the background for all the tech stuff and roger it was just so lovely to finally meet oh, you oh it's nice to meet you i can't wait for COVID to you so after meet to meet in meet in real life you, you know, know and i i also just wanted to say what there was a lot of um wonderful kind of uncanny resonances wasn't there with yeah the rapture yeah. and then yeah, your yeah, yeah. amazing rapture poem but yeah, also yeah, yeah. horse you know i'd said i'm writing a poem in horse and yeah. then we get you know stubs dissections and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it, it all kind of spoke and connected to each other so it yes. was really special yes 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 all right guys Thank you very much. Well, for indeed. Have a I, never, I, never, I never know how to end these things, really. So just <laughs> thank, you, thank you very much. And hopefully we'll see you in the flesh someday right. very soon. Cool, cool. Take it easy. Right. Bye, thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.